Okay, so let me introduce our keynote speaker. Um, so our keynote today is Mary Beth Kerry. She's just finished her PhD at, in the Human Computer Interaction Institute at CMU. And she's basically um, interested in programming practices and improving developer experience. And she's especially interested in data science and exploratory data analysis and using methods from HCI to kind of make that easier and design new tools. And she's also passionate about um, HCI, ethical considerations surrounding HCI and design. And most recently, she's worked on a really interesting system called Mage, um, which is a system for notebook programming, which supports tools that can represent themselves as both code and GUI widgets. So hopefully that's something we're going to hear a bit about today. And I think she's also currently available for a postdoc. So that's something you might like to uh, talk to her about afterwards. And over to you, Mary Beth. Cool. Thanks. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, still a mystery why you did, but I'm very excited to talk about anything to do with live programming. And I love talking about notebook programming, which is what I'm going to share a bit about today. I'm going to cover sort of a big picture around notebook programming and then more specifically our recent like mage work, which uh, really already introduced. All right. So quick speaker stats. I'm actually a current PhD student. I am still in the dredge of finishing my thesis. Um, I work at Carnegie Mellon University um, in the Human Computer Interaction Institute. Uh, my advisor is Brad Myers, and we work on everything to do with programming in HCI sort of lens. I particularly love exploratory creative forms of programming. Um, my background is in art, actually, um, before I kind of found the light of computer science. So I love programming as a kind of creative medium, and I spent a really lot of time lately thinking about how people explore, particularly with data, in the context of programming and notebook programming. So I'm going to talk a whole lot about notebook programming. And I'm first going to introduce it just in case you're not familiar. It's um, a massively popular form of interactive computing and programming has become really, really hot in the past, say, 10 years, 20 years at best, mostly past 10 years. So this is really popular. It's really new sort of um, and this is approximately what it looks like. So this is the canonical notebook programming interface. Um, this is a Jupyter notebook. It runs in a browser. So this is my little Chrome tab. I've got all of these cells that I can run and it's an interactive programming session. So to break this down a little further, um, I want to kind of cover, these are the key components of a notebook programming interface. And they can take lots of forms, but these are sort of the constants across all notebook programming. You've got a bunch of cells. Each of these cells can be one of three, let's say, things. The first is formatted text, so markdown usually. You've got, you can have headers and, and, and rich text, uh, little symbols, equations, pictures, videos, whatever you like. And this is really for explaining your code, usually an analysis of data. Then you've got these code cells. Code cells can be run one at a time. Um, they can just change state, like this import statement, or they can have output. Output can be visual, it can be interactive, it can be multimedia, or it can just be plain text that you'd see in like a terminal output type thing. So a notebook has all these cells, they run one at a time, and it's run in a context of an interactive programming session. So when you run one of these, it updates the state of the whole programming session, and this is um, sustained throughout your programming session. All right, so I believe that notebooks are really, really awesome, and I hope to convince you of that too. However, notebook programming is a more recent sort of programming paradigm, and it definitely does have limitations. It's not awesome for everything, and I'll be the first to admit that. So if you want to learn more about the drawbacks of notebook programming, I'm not going to go into it, but I can point you to some great places. The first, um, in 2018, um, Joel Gruss gave this talk at JupyterCon on I don't like notebooks. And that's such a power move to diss notebooks at a conference about notebooks. But it's a really funny talk. Um, it's on YouTube, and it, it goes into a lot of details. A lot of the complaints have to do with notebooks are not really that great as software artifacts. They have a lot of flaws. Um, if you're doing software engineering with notebooks, just stop. Don't do it. That's a lot of what's going on in that. 
And then in 2020, this awesome team of programming HCI-ish researchers came out with this paper at CHI on what is wrong with notebook, but with com computational notebooks. Um, and they did a study of a bunch of people and list out a bunch of stuff. It's a, it's a lot of the same kind of things. It's notebook programming is not necessarily a great software artifact. It has a lot of problems with scalability and correctness and all the things we love as computer scientists. However, I like to center all conversations around notebooks around what are their primary use cases? So yeah, they're not for everything, but what are they really, really good at? Now, these are three use cases that we kind of came up with. We went to JupyterCon, the same conference um, that Joel talked at, and we basically interviewed a whole bunch of users of notebooks and said, well, what do you use notebooks for? And we did the whole HCI process of getting all that data together, boiled it down. These are three sort of main use cases that notebooks excel at and lots of people use it for. So the first one is a scratch pad. So the kind of thing that you would jot down on a napkin or a back of an envelope or something, people use uh, notebooks to try out quick ideas, just like they use that interactive programming session to just like get syntax right or you know try out a risky idea that they don't want to put in their like real important code. The second one is prolonged experimentation. So this is really popular if you're doing data analysis, you're building up an analysis, you're building up a model or whatever, um, you're gonna spend a lot of time sort of showing your work, showing your progress and showing your process in a notebook. A lot of people like to think it's sort of a substitute for sort of the pen and paper style of a lab notebook that you would have if you were you know, a chemist. If you're a computational chemist, maybe the um, notebook programming environment is your lab notebook. And the last one that's really important is notebooks as presentation. A lot of people use notebooks to actually share uh, data analysis or models with other people. And this happens in education settings, like for teaching purposes or for presentations at companies, for like conveying information to people. So these use cases, are, are really popular for what um, notebooks do, but they also are pretty distinct in what maybe would best serve those use cases. Now, in this, just to give you the quick scope of this talk, I'm gonna be introducing a lot of ideas about notebooks. And what I really, really wanna convince you of is two things. The first, notebook programming is not really established. It's been around for a while, but it's still actively evolving as a real notebook programming kind of paradigm, like what it means is very negotiable still. People have a lot of opinions and you as researchers and as like people who develop tools can have a lot of impact on what notebook programming is. So that's fun. And the second part is really more focused around live programming. And that is that liveliness, reactivity and interactivity are really, really important to what we're doing next in terms of notebook programming. And I'm gonna share some of my research in that space. So to start with the first one, um, I wanna kind of convince you what notebook programming is and that it's a very hazy thing currently. And to do that, I'd like to actually take us on a brief history story time. I love history story times. I love history of computing. Um, and notebooks have a really kind of interesting origin story. So they actually date from 1988 is the first sort of public record of a notebook that we that I can find. Um, and despite that, they're really only evolving as a popular programming paradigm now. Um, so what I found, this is my own interpretation of history, let's say, from reading a bunch of uh, work on notebooks, is that these sort of three use cases that we found, presentation, experimentation, and scratch pads, actually come, are a kind of combination of ideas from three ish sort of historical traditions of programming. And the really fun thing is none of these traditions of programming are actually mainstream software engineering. So that's pretty fun. Um, so I'm going to walk us through a little bit of history. I wasn't alive then when a lot of this stuff happened. So if you were, please feel free to correct me. All right. So the first spot I want to hit is 1984. We see the introduction of literate programming. Now, literate programming and notebooks together are talked about a lot in the past five years or so. Um, so we see a lot of stuff like this. 
literate programming we talk about in the terms of these markdown cells that we see in our notebooks, the markdown cells that allow us to explain what's going on. Um, and literate programming is talked about a lot in the um, situation of presentation. So here's a snippet from Hacker News, somebody saying, Jupyter notebooks seem to be the modern form of literate programming because look, I am seeing people write entire textbooks in a this sort of literate style in this programming environment. So people do write entire programming textbooks in uh, notebooks, that's a thing. And so a lot of people have tied it to the idea of literate programming. And in 2018, we see the study where researchers went and looked at like all the notebooks they could find on the internet pretty much, GitHub everywhere. And they were like, oh my gosh, people are not like actually putting markdown in these rich explanations in their notebook. And oh my goodness, I really think they should. That's pretty much what the research is coming up with. Um, however, what I really think is fun about this is although we have this pretty strong idea, if you dig into the community today that, oh gosh, notebooks are literate programming environments. This is really sort of uh, something that we added very recently. And literate programming in 1984 was not about notebooks at all. It's really not even that related. Um, but what happened in 1984, Donald Knuth introduces literate programming. Um, he's best known for creating tech, which is the predecessor of LaTeX, which many of us use. Um, and his big idea is that documentation should be equally important to the code itself. So you're writing code, you should also write a ton of documentation. And that documentation should be treated as a first class citizen by being rich text side by side interleaved with code. And that idea has really resonated to what we do today. But what we think of as literate programming today is this whole markdown business in our notebooks as really, really not what they were actually talking about in 1984. In 1984, literate programming was actually a campaign in the idea of we have really bad software documentation and we need good software documentation. So software documentation for software engineering was bad in the 1980s. It's bad now. I don't have time to sort of go into that rich literature, but I'm just going to sum it up in these memes, which is basically documentation is takes a really long time to make. It's never up to date and nobody wants to do it. So Donald Knuth is like, oh my gosh, we should make uh, documentation like the be all end all of what we do. And we should make code super, super readable by adding more documentation. And the central irony, I think, of this 1984 paper is that this, <laughs> this notation here is what he actually meant by literate programming. And to me, this is not remotely readable. Um, I would not want to write in this ever. And this doesn't even look like plain English, but at the time, that's what he was going for. Um, just as a side note, I think these old papers are super funny because people say like way more spicy stuff than they do today. So in this particular instance, he says pretty much, if you're a real computer scientist, you're gonna like my notation. And if you're not a real computer scientist or you don't care about documentation, you won't. So that definitely makes me a not real computer scientist. Anyway, literate programming goes out of fat, comes into fashion, goes out of fashion really quickly because it actually doesn't solve any of these major problems. Adding more documentation doesn't solve the problem of it going out of date, no one wants to write it, and it takes forever. So it doesn't get adopted here, but it does have an important impact, these two ideas, in the future on what we think about in notebook programming. Now, in 1988, we have our first notebook appear, and this is um, the first one that I can find, at least. So there may have been others previous, but this is definitely the first public release of a notebook. Um, and it occurs in Mathematica. It's designed by Theodore Gray for Mathematica. That's a software suite for mathematicians. It's based on computational algebra languages. Um, and what I really want you to take away here is this is 1988 notebook. This is a 2015 notebook. They're basically the same. In terms of a note, in terms of the layout, you have these um, these little cells of code. You have your visual output. It's the same deal. Basically, the the whole layout and design of a notebook really did not evolve from 1988 until 2015 or so. Same thing, All right? Um, the big sort of turning point where we start to get into modern data computing, modern um, understanding of notebook computing, is around 2001. 
So in 2001, IPython is released. IPython is created by Fernando Perez. Later, Brian Granger joins the project. And they are both physicists. And they want to create better software and do better coding. And they're like, everybody, stop programming in Fortran. We are going to make Python the place where you want to do your scientific computing. So they make this really um, nice interactive shell. It's like you type in your terminal, it's an interactive shell programming environment and allows you to create these nice visualizations that are interactive and try out stuff. So a key point I wanna um, point out from both of these things at this point is that our notebook in Mathematica and our IPython shell are both forms of interactive programming. These are not your standard software artifact. This is a quick, you know, I'm going to try a bunch of stuff out and see what happens form of programming specifically for scientists and mathematicians. That's because science, math, and data really, 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 really needs interactive programming to work with. Why? It's because what most of what you're doing when you're engaging with science, math, and data through um, computation is doing exploratory programming. And what that means is we delve into a paper like way back in 2017. Um, it has origins in the 80s, just like everything else. But the general idea of exploratory programming is that you're going into a code not knowing exactly what you're gonna find. You're using code to explore ideas and experiment, try stuff out. And it's not like when you're given, you know, a, an image of a black hole, you can like, oh, I'll just write the code that gives the image of the black hole. No, you have to try stuff out before you're sort of able to produce that. There's not a nice program specification or plan that you can implement like you can in software engineering perhaps. So in 2011, um, we finally get what we know as the modern um, notebook. And that comes out of a combination of these three sort of strains of ideas. Now, we IPython was originally sort of a scratch pad environment. It's a terminal. It was completely transient. You couldn't keep your code unless you copy paste it into like an editor. So what they decide is they really, really want you to be able to do everything you can exploratory in IPython, but do it in a way that can be kept, shared, and reproduced. And they basically copy the design of tools like Mathematica because, again, um, Brian Granger and Fernando Perez are physicists. That's the style of notebook programming they are very familiar with as scientists. So they copy this sort of design, they bring in the IPython sort of interactive computing in Python, and they also at this point loop in uh, literate programming. And the purpose of that is that they want to be able to explain what's going on in this computation. Weird. Um, so here with symbols and stuff, because science code in itself is not self-explanatory, you sort of have to give people context for what you're doing. So all these ideas are combined into a notebook. Um, in 2011, this is sort of our canonical notebook that we understand, but a really fun kind of trivia bit is that they actually took 10 years to develop this notebook. So if you ever, ever feel slow about creating your software, you're in good company. And they actually say that because it took them 10 years to release this notebook, they were able to see a lot of preliminary earlier forms of notebooks that people were coming out with. They weren't the only people who had this idea. Um, and they were able to take what they didn't like about it and create IPython notebooks, which were really a combination of the best ideas of things. And it really, 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 really takes off. Um, so they have 2 million users by 2015. That's just four short years. And what's happening around this time, why notebooks sort of explode into popularity is that previously notebooks were really this niche thing for mathematicians, scientists. All of a sudden in the 2010s, everybody's got like oodles of data. Everybody needs to work with data. Suddenly everybody is doing scientific data computing, mathematical computing, everybody needs to do it. So this becomes from a niche thing just for scientists to something that everybody wants. And notebooks are a nice way to compromise that interactive programming environment with something that you can share, reproduce, so on. So in 2014, 2015, although IPython notebooks were originally just like a little feature in IPython sort of sweet. Um, it branches off into its own project because it's become so successful that it actually eclipses 
the original project for IPython. So they uh, transitioned into Project Jupiter um, to make something language agnostic, although I think that's actually pretty funny because they want to make a language agnostic notebook, but then they name it after their three favorite programming languages. They take Julia, Python, and R and just like smoosh them together into Jupiter, and that's Jupiter. So around this time, we have Jupyter release. Notebooks become sort of a formalized thing um, available to everybody. And what I really like reading from this time is that um, Perez and Granger you know, are, are trying to transition into Jupyter Notebooks. They need money. Everybody needs money to, to get your work done. They're a free open source project. They need funding. So they write this grant in 2015, which you can read. It's online. And they kind of project what are our main goals for notebooks in the next five, 10 years. And although this is really interesting as like a tidbit of open source software history, I think the goals they lay out actually are pretty much what all of us have been working on in notebooks for the last 10 years or so, or it hasn't been 10 years, whatever. Um, until Up until now, this is something that the whole community has been working on. All right, so the first one is a focus on computational narrative to support reproducibility and comprehension. So the notebook interface was originally just sort of like an interactive terminal thing. It was just sort of like a, you know, we're trying out some code. We're pivoting to making notebooks more about storytelling, more about narrative to support all those people who are actually adopting notebooks as a way to educate and share with others. So that's a really big goal. The second part is we want to make computational narratives more accessible to a non-coding audience. And you may be like, hold up, wait, what? We're talking about Python. We're talking about a programming environment. But remember, the, a lot of the original users for notebooks were scientists or mathematicians. They're not coding experts. They may be experts in chemistry or astronomy. So making um, computational narratives something that not a coding expert can access and work with is really, really important for their core users. So they propose making um, computational narratives more accessible to a non-coding audience by allowing non-coders in the notebook to do statistical analysis and visualizations on data from new samples using a simplified graphical user interface. So basically what they're saying is that we want notebooks not only to just be like this coding platform, we also want people to be able to do work through GUIs and widgets in this um, environment to do data analysis work even if they can't code. So that's pretty important. And um, that's something we haven't really achieved. And the third one is collaboration. This one I'm not gonna go into, it should be pretty self-explanatory. Um, in science, we need collaboration. In data analysis, we need collaboration. In teaching settings, team settings. So this has been a focus of a lot of notebook work. All right, so by 2014, 2015, all of a sudden, notebooks are much bigger. They kind of explode out and notebook programming is much bigger than the canonical um, IPython notebook. It's become something that lots and lots of companies, important tech companies, all sorts of startups and different players are kind of taking their own approach to. So since 2015, we've seen a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of notebook programming um, platforms and different languages sort of like pop out of nowhere. And here are 10 of the most common that I could think of, but there are a lot more. And many of these are really pretty much clones of the classic Jupyter notebook we've been looking at, but each of them take what notebook programming is in their own sort of flavor and direction. So at this point, I really want to um, sort of highlight two um, types of notebook that we find in 2020 that are taking notebook programming in pretty different directions. And I want to um, highlight these two examples, not because they're like the best notebook platforms ever, but because they're really, really different. And I want to sort of convince you that notebook programming is something that you can take wherever you want. And it's something that is happening right now. And as a tool builder and as a researcher, you can have a lot of say in that. So on the left, this is Observable. It's created in 2018. And on the right is JupyterLab, 
which is from 2019-ish. Um, so Jupyter Lab is the second generation of Jupyter Notebooks from the original IPython Jupyter team. And what you can see is they've translated a notebook into something that looks a lot more like your everyday IDE. If we look over here on Observable, this is also a notebook. However, it doesn't look like an IDE. There's a lot of visuals. There's like this pretty stuff going on with text and there's barely any code to be found. So I'm gonna contrast these two examples. I would say um, Jupyter Lab represents a kind of bigger agenda in the notebook community, which I, I would call um, software engineering needs to come save us. Basically, we want notebooks to translate into something that's more of a respectable, legit software artifact. And this comes out of all of a sudden notebooks are being used by everyone. Everybody needs to use it. And all of a sudden software engineers have to deal with notebooks that were created by academics and researchers and those flaky Pete hooligans that are making this exploratory messy code. So from a software engineering lens, it's sort of this um, a little bit preaching of we're going to convert these wild exploratory programmers into creating good code and creating um, code that can be actually translated into production systems. So this comes out of the frustration of software engineers who have to work with data analysis and data um, scientists and visualization people. They want software engineering to sort of be integrated into notebook programming, make it that unruly messiness um, something a little more um, easy to deal with. And we can see this in Jupyter Lab. They're kind of translating notebooks into a traditional IDE environment. Most IDEs today, like Visual Studio Code, as of like 2019, 2020, are integrating in notebook viewers in the classic IDE. So you can use your, you know, linters or formatters or what have you, nice software tools to make all of your notebook code super awesome. And we also have in the research community, this is a Kai paper from 2019, um, in which a bunch of really cool people at Microsoft, UC Berkeley, Georgia Tech, et cetera, are trying to see how we can sort of refactor notebooks for people, make them nice. So this is something I very much believe in, but there is a tension. Um, I went to a Jupyter conference a couple of times to talk with users to sort of get their feel about notebook programming, what they want. And as somebody who's been trained in software engineering, I'm like, of course you want to see the light and like become a good software engineer. But if you Think about who are the original core users of notebooks. These are scientists, uh, researchers, people that um, aren't software engineers and they don't really want to be software engineers. So there is a little bit of resentment among some parts of the community who think that this direction is actually trying to force everybody to be a software engineer when they don't want to be. So I'm presenting the, the tension there, but I do believe in this mission. Um, a second major agenda that is more um, on the side of the other notebook I was showing you, the observable ones, is that instead of pushing notebooks in a software engineering direction, we want to push it more in an end user programming direction and more of a non programming direction, honestly. So we want interactive visual exploration through widgets um, to let everybody understand data, even if you're not able to code. So the problem is data computation already is intensive for visualization and explanation. Um, and code is really, really abstract when you get to data and stuff. So even if you're an expert, you do a lot of visualizations, and especially if you're not an expert and not a coder, interactions and visualization can give you a lot of information. So I'm gonna show you a brief example in Observable. This is a notebook where you're gonna see almost no code. So this is a maybe a little bit of a traumatizing visualization for us in the US recently, at least. Um, this visualization allows you to sort of play with different options for who would win the election under which circumstances. And this is an interactive visualization. Now we see a lot of text in this notebook explaining the visualization. And at the bottom, we see a whole bunch of code, which is how we made the visualization. So this notebook really has at its center the interactive visualization for some kind of audience who's going to look at this notebook and isn't maybe interested in the code. All right. I mean, at this point in the talk, I want to pivot away from looking at notebooks globally to really focusing in on this idea of live interactivity and this idea around widgets. So 
what we saw in um, this example just now in observables is a really common style of um, notebooks today where we're using notebooks to create sort of a dashboard or interactive widgets to show our students, show our audience, show a, somebody who's not coding to be able to explore data and understand stuff. And this is really, really common, not just in observables, but any notebook platform. The second widget style, which now I wanna kind of pivot to talking about is a little bit different. It's, we're gonna use widgets to do sort of live programming to actually help us explore ideas in the process of coding. So it's not that we're coding to produce a widget for someone else, but rather we're using the widget to help us in our own process. And the line there is a little fuzzy, but again, I'm gonna show you observable just cause it's really pretty. Um, and what you can see here let me pause. I think it's going a little fast. Um, there's a slider here. Oh, what? I'm sorry. I clicked too many things. Um, there is a slider here. There is a value of X here. It's a little bit blocked by the zoom thing. Um, basically what happens is zoom go away. Um, when you move the slider in the notebook, it changes the value of X. And this is doing something that's called reactive programming. So if I create a value Y that adds 10 to X, that's a value. Um, and then I, I go back with my slider to play around with X. This is not only gonna update the value of X, it's also gonna update the value of Y. This is called reactive programming because what it's doing is keeping track of the dependencies on X so that that little slider is going to update the entire state in my notebook appropriately. So reactivity is an important part of interaction in the notebook. Not all notebooks support it. It's kind of an opinion thing. So I just wanted to put that out there. Now, most of widgets in notebooks today look a lot like this. They're sliders. Um, Observables has a lot of pretty sliders. Um, we have things like sliders, color pickers, um, iPy widgets in your standard notebook. You can do drop down menus or um, click on a value or something like that. But ultimately, all we have in mainstream notebooks, pretty much, no matter how pretty this is, is we're adjusting our code through basic parameter tuning. We can change a single value, like color, rotation, quake size, through tuning a parameter. But we can't really do like rich analysis work beyond, I'm gonna play with this parameter. That's sort of all we got. And if we return back to these ideas that um, uh, Perez and Granger put out in 2015, they wanna make um, computational narratives accessible to non-coding so that you can, if you're a non-coder, you can do actual meaningful real data analysis using these GUI widget tools. But at this point, all we have is perimeter tuning. So the idea is, can we do more than that? And this is the topic of my latest research, which I did um, with some collaborators at Apple. So this I presented at WIS 2020 is pretty fun. So I definitely hope you will check it out. And what Mage is about is trying to move in a general sense beyond that like widget thing um, of just parameter tuning. So I'm gonna show a quick demo video. So you get a sense, this is a notebook. In the notebook, I'm gonna load a data set of Pokemon because I love Pokemon. Um, and I'm gonna sort of demonstrate what interactivity looks like now and what we want it to be. So here I'm gonna show a table. This is a what you see in a notebook today. And you can like see it, but you can't really like do anything with it. So what we want to do in Mage instead is should be pretty obvious and we're definitely not the first to propose this, but we wanna create a table where you can actually do stuff like you could in like numbers or Excel. So in this Pokemon table, I'm gonna actually be able to drag around columns, for example. And when I move the name of the Pokemon to the front of the table, this is actually gonna generate code that achieves that action. Um, and I can go on and you know keep organizing my table and that's gonna generate code that appropriately matches what I'm doing. Now at this point, you may be like, wait, why do we need to generate code? Why can't we just like play around in the table all day? And that's um, a little bit of a contentious issue, but basically there are some widgets that allow you to play around on a table all day, but 
they break reproducibility and they're very, very fragile. So if your internet goes out or your session needs to restart or something, you may lose all of your work in this table. By translating it into code, we ensure that everything you do is reproducible and that you're not gonna lose any of that work. So seeing code maybe isn't for everybody, but it is a really important medium to allow reproducibility, readability of like, oh, this is what the actions that you did, this is how you transform the table and allow you to keep your work in a meaningful way. All right, now I'm gonna show you a second example. In this one, instead of playing around with tables, we're gonna play around with plots. So I hope I did not mess this up. I think I messed this up. I messed this up. Let me see if this is the right video. Okay, now I'm not messed up anymore. So this time we're gonna summon a plot tool instead of a table tool. And this is an interactive chart builder. So I can build a chart in Python, you can build a chart in Python, but it takes, uh, it's really fussy. Like you can grab code, but it gets really, really fussy. So what we're gonna do instead is use this sort of uh, GUI based chart builder to create um, some visualizations of our Pokemon. And the magical thing we could do is we can actually select from the GUI and take it back into code. And then we can also use our table tool to do some more like data analysis, this time on just the selection of our psychic Pokemon. So what I'm trying to show here is that we can actually achieve this fluid back and forth between working in code and working in GUI. We don't really need to choose between the two like we have to today in a lot of tools. All right, so the main point is that we can have rich GUI tools that allow us to do rich kinds of data work that's actually like actually affecting the state, actually affecting your data in a notebook and how we're gonna bridge the gap between these rich GUI tools and notebook computing is that we're gonna generate code for you. And what we did in this paper is we tried out a whole bunch of different um, GUI widget type things because our goal was to see, can we figure out something that will generalize that we can bring to tool creators that they can create their um, you know, widget and create something that can generate code because generating code is kind of hard. Um, so what we do in this case is we try to use the simplest solution possible. We use code templates. Um, so what this looks like is in, you have your table. This is a table. You can do a lot of table-y things to it, right? Um, and what we have is we have the tool creator, the person who creates this nice little table widget. In this case, it was me. Um, also come up with templates. And whoop. Whoops, this is what they look like. So we can have multiple code templates to allow the same GUI tool to support all kinds of different languages, and all kinds of different platforms. What it looks like if you're not familiar with code templates is basically we've got a type based fill in the blank. They're gonna say, okay, we need a data frame, we need columns and to, this is for um, removing columns, produce code that looks something like this. Insert their table and this is the actual syntax that we need to create and drop the specific columns that they select in the GUI. So the GUI tool creator is giving us a template and they're giving us in live real time what is actually happening so that Mage is gonna take this template and resolve it based on the actual programming environment. So the tool creator doesn't need to know all the static analysis stuff about what's going on in the programming environment. They just sort of give us instructions about what should happen and Mage sort of makes that happen. And what this looks like is pretty good sometimes, but there's a major limitation to our approach, which we don't solve. Um, and that is um, nice code generation that looks fluid and looks good and is readable is actually really context dependent. So simply you know, outputting some new generated code every time somebody does something in the table creates a complete mess. So here's a very simple example. In this example, I add a column called education into my table, and then I move that column from 14 to two. So I'm just inserting a column and then I'm moving it. Now, what we'd like is instead of inserting it and moving it, we could, if I was a human generating this code, I'd probably just write, okay, I'm just gonna insert it at two in the first place. This is much nicer code. It's two lines instead of five or six to do the same thing. So what we can do in Mage is kind of create these combined compressed forms of code that actually look nice and readable, but 
it requires context dependent information from the tool creator because we don't know how operations combine. We don't know the order of operations for a table versus an image editor or all these other possible forms of tools. So this is a major problem because it puts a lot more spec requirements and all that sort of nonsense on the tool creator. So the main idea I want you to take from Mage is that this kind of powerful um, sort of tools for working in GUIs and code are really possible, but the generalization bit is what's really hard. Um, and I want to highlight some related work that does really similar things recently. Um, and that's Rex is a, a table editor. It's using program by example, which many of us are familiar with. Basically, we have somebody working in the table and it generates code for them based on example. B2 is another really recent one. Um, it allows people to play around with visualizations and it's gonna generate code to generate those visualizations in live real time in a reactive way based on their selections. Now the power in these two is that they're not trying to generalize. B2 uses a domain specific language, a DSL to power this. And Rex uses programming by example that only works for tables. So these two things can be super powerful DSLs and programming by example in one tool in a specific context, but it's hard to generalize. So this is an open challenge I just want to sort of leave you with is that live programming via GUIs, um, it allows more people to participate in data analysis. It really is a goal of the community, but it's really hard to generalize between the simple parameter tuning that we have today to something that is substantially more powerful. And as I wrap up, I also want to um, sort of push again that notebook programming means a lot of different things to different people. Use cases are pretty far across the board in a lot of different people and communities are pushing um, notebook programming in different ways. And as a tool developer and as a researcher, you have a lot of power if you wanna get involved in notebook programming to, to set the agenda for what that is. All right, um, and yes, Again, just to sort of conclude here, I hope that you get involved in notebook programming as live programming researchers. There's a lot to do in that space if you're interested in interactivity um, and you can have a lot of influence on that space. So thank you so much for hearing all about notebooks um, and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Mary Beth. That was a really, really great talk. Um, okay, so we've ended with 15 minutes, which is what perfect timing. So um, feel free to either put a question into chat if you want me to ask it, or if you want to just unmute yourself and ask it yourself, that's probably a nicer way to do it. So feel free to do that as well. And by the way, we had 50 participants for that. So that was pretty cool. Very good attendance. So Thanks for the great talk, Mary Beth. That was really interesting. Uh, so I, I wanted to ask about how in in Mage you're kind of is it Mage or Mage or both? Okay, uh, how you're able to kind of like you know say that you don't have to choose either code or GUI. You can kind of you know bridge the gap. Uh, I also wonder if that same uh, goal could apply to these two splits that you showed between Jupyter Lab as like a software engineering IDE uh, kind of thing versus you know something more end user or non programmer uh, focused. I wonder if you think you know that dichotomy is something that could also be bridged. Does it really have to be that um, these tools either have to be built for like production software engineering or for you know everybody else, or can can that be kind of bridged as well? Do you think? I think that's a bit tricky actually, because that gap between I am a like pro software engineer coder and the more end user programming side is really, really pervasive. So when we actually, um, sorry, slides. Okay, so we took a lot of these tools to professional data scientists. I didn't talk about that, but we did, we said it in front of people who do this for a living. Some of them are, you know, end user program side, they're statisticians or something, and others are software engineers. And what we found is a really big divide on some people loved this, especially if they didn't like writing code and they liked working in like a spreadsheet or something that was more familiar. 
But a lot of people who were coding experts was like, I would never use this because I just want to code all day. So I think it's really hard to kind of meet requirements of everyone, if that answers your question. Rabbi, you're muted, I think, if you were. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I said that is that is answer my question. Yeah, I think it is hard. Um, I guess I wonder how many humans are in like this intersection where they might want to do both. <laughs> but you're, you're right, satisfying all of these goals is, is certainly a huge challenge. Yeah, I, I do want to add that a lot of um, the visualization and widget oriented work is a lot of it is for end user programmers, but a lot of it is also for professional programmers. Even if you're a machine learning developer expert, for example, those people really, really, really want interactive widgets for their super complex tasks because it's cognitively like even too difficult for them. So it's not, everybody does need widgets and interaction. It's just sort of a matter of what and when. Well, I have a question. If, if nobody else does, please feel free to put your hand up if you do. Um, so I've, it's got a slight variation, I suppose, on Ravi's question, which is, um, and I guess you touched on this when you were talking about the different use cases, like kind of exploratory data analysis versus presentation, for example. So you could imagine even as a single person with a particular kind of skill set, you might still have a reason for your notebook to have different audiences at different times. You know, so it, it seems kind of a bit of a drag in a way to ask people to take their work and write it up in a really nice sort of presented way and a really kind of explanatory way for, for one audience and then use a completely different notebook for doing the actual work. Have you thought about how you could kind of have different views of the same document that, that kind of serve the needs of different stakeholders, if you like? You know, you could imagine taking a piece of work and giving it to a funder, writing it up one way, writing something up for a kind of public you know, a sort of um, popular science audience and something for perhaps teaching and sort of derive all those from the same underlying computational data science. Yeah, that is super, super interesting. So there's a couple of things here. Um, the sort of three use cases, oftentimes it's very common for somebody to transition between. So like you said, like I'm working on something, but now I need to write it up for somebody um, and I'm going to add a bunch of explanation. Um, and then you end up with a very different notebook and a very different uh, set of stuff than what you want to work on. And sort of maintaining state between those two can be really tricky. Um, sort of my nine to five job, so to speak, in my dissertation, I'm really interested in sort of version control sort of geared solutions of how to sort of get back to where you're interested in and, and not sort of have to make that compromise. but. I think it's a really interesting open problem. And I think a lot of people are interested in ways of presenting the same notebook to different audiences. Um, so it's a little long winded, but one thing users said when I interviewed is that some people really never wanna see the code. If you're a manager, you don't wanna see the code, but other members of the team do wanna see the code because they wanna give you code reviews. So the same document is gonna convey different information for different people and not everybody wants to see the same information. So that's right. a really important point. Yeah, and as, as you say, the kind of the, the challenge you run into, I guess, is when one view gets kind of stale because you're focusing on another view and then you need to sort of reconcile things or you just risk kind of invalidating the work you've done for a different audience. Yeah, I think it could be a really rad tool to mm. facilitate that. Somebody needs to do that. Okay, we've got a couple of questions uh, from the audience now. So Jens, first of all. Hey, uh, thank you for the excellent uh, presentation. Um, in Mage, I, I wonder you you motivated mixing the, the UI and sorting table and inserting things and focusing things and produce code and produce Python or, or other code. Did you think about uh, at the pre-step of it maybe just show the user the configuration like this is this table is sorted, this, uh, this um, column is moved like in a JSON file or some other thing, like when you have a configuration, you might not have to go the full way of, of being a full programming language and it might be easier to generate. Yeah, so um, that's a really interesting 
fit. So we do have one example that we explored actually because we ran out of time. <laughs> uh, in visualization, we used a Vega light specification language, which is much more similar to something that you can pop in a JSON file and read. Um, and it's meant to be easier to edit than writing Python to do visualization. We wanted to support Python, but we ran out of time. So we just plopped in the spec language is what happened. Um, and I think like you say, this is easier for some people and some people hate it. It's it's really kind of a matter of opinion. So some people At least like the spec language. For you to, to support and to implement, it's not maybe easier to use, but uh, eventually maybe it's uh, like you motivated it with, uh, okay, we want to make it reproducible and things. And then I said, oh, but then you get, went all the way and now we have uh, programming by example we have to do. So, uh, but okay. Yeah, yeah. So in the short term, just generating a spec that can reproduce the state of what they ended up with, that is a really good idea for you avoid a lot of the complexity of actual code generation by just kind of keeping this spec. This example is way simpler than all of our other examples because we can just use a spec. It's not as, the thing you lose there is you for the people who are sort of in between, they do want to work with both code and GUI, you do lose usability there because people generally want to um, work in something more portable and you do have to kind of create your own spec for every GUI. But it, as a short-term solution to sort of save state and allow people to work in GUI, this does definitely work. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, I'm gonna take one more question from the audience and then take a question from the chat. So uh, Raphael, first of all. Hi, thank you. I'm Raphael Wimmer, University of Regensburg. Um, a notebook is some kind of a framework where you have a strict order, where you have dependencies between parts, and uh, that's very helpful in many cases. But is there any research, are there any notebooks which are more like libraries, which allow you to reassemble or uh, combine multiple notebooks? Because at the moment, it's a monolithic uh, notebook i'm only using one notebook at a time usually is there some way to remix notebooks um so i think that's something that the community is really interested in so the yeah the plain notebook you can import like python modules when people want to use a notebook in a different notebook oftentimes what they do is export your notebook as a python module and then import into the next notebook which is really clunky um so there are definitely projects where people want to import notebooks into other notebooks and make sort of these meta notebooks. Um, I think some people who are critics of that approach think that it might just be a rabbit hole of notebooks of this maze of crazy um, notebook code that's not like a nice formal like Python or R module. Um, but yeah, they're really, so you can move around cells in notebooks and in the classic notebook, you can actually run them in any order. So the dependency thing is really more of a recent push they're really more free and wild in the original iteration, but you're right in that modularity of bigger pieces is a really big question of how we should do that. And I don't think anybody has an answer. Does that answer your question? I see some frowning. Thank you. Uh, Raphael, you, you're muted if you did say anything. Yes, you I'm happy, thank you. Okay. Right, so we've got a question from Jeremy in the chat, which is, is, uh, is your narrative of notebook origins a revisionist history? It asked in a friendly way, does interactive computational notebook programming spring from a tradition of read eval print loops going all the way back to Lisp? It definitely comes from Lisp. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I sort of, it is a little bit of a revisionist history. I sort of um, picked and choose some spots that I thought were particularly important. But yeah, we're going all the way back to Lisp if we're real, um, especially in the interactive computing in a terminal that goes way back to the very beginning of, of computing. Um, what I really want to show here in particular is that from what I can find currently of where notebooks come from, almost all of them are revisionist histories there. And they're really contradictory. Um, so some people think that notebooks sort of sprang out of literary programming, that's definitely false. Um, and I'm trying to just say they come from a different bunch of different places. But if you actually know more about what they came from, that would be really interesting because I 
don't think anybody really knows other than they it seems to have come about of people encountered something they liked and they added it together into a tool and then someone else encountered something else and then they added it but there's no real formal lineage that i can find of these things if that makes sense so yeah it's totally made up i'll just follow up with a kind of finger on that just because uh, we don't have another question in the queue but actually one thing that occurred to me is that you know, another sort of dimension, if you like, of the history of notebooks is the history of scientific notebooks. Because, I, I, I mean, the kind of use cases you talked about, the kind of um, dissemination versus, you know, recording your kind of workflow for your own use um, and so on, they, they really have a history in the tradition of science itself, I think. So, I mean, in, in, the, seven, in the 18th century, whenever people first started publishing journals, that was a kind of response to worries about reproducibility and openness and that there was all this knowledge locked up in labs and in scientists' heads that wasn't being kind of shared into the community. So it's almost like computing has really brought those concerns to the fore again, and we're just kind of recapitulating all that stuff all over again. And I, I wondered if you thought about that as a kind of parallel narrative in a sense. Yeah, there's a whole ton of, there's a huge backstory in scientific computing for sort of the computational lab notebook. And there's been over the decades, like a lot of different sort of attempts to make a computational lab notebook. But the thing is, nobody's really come up with a solution that everyone's happy with. Nobody, there, there is no real killer app that people have for a computational like scientific lab notebook. A lot of people are hoping that notebooks would be it and it, it really hasn't shaped out to be perfect for that either. So that's definitely an one origin story but that gets into all of these like crazy interactive systems I didn't quite want to get into, <laughs> yeah. Okay, we've got one quick question we'll take from the chat. So do you know any work that combines notebooks with inspector styled environments such as small talk and cell? Mm, I don't know of any, well, so you mean inspector styles? Uh, it's been a while since I've seen small talk. Uh, well, if you, if you I, I can uh, clarify my question. So in small talk, you can you can look at you can uh, point to a piece of code and then say do it or inspect it or print it, and I have the impression that these notebooks they only are the equivalent of printed, whereas if you uh, select a menu option, uh, inspect it, an inspector opens up and you can really like dig into the object that you are inspecting, so you can inspect subfields and dig deeper and deeper and deeper and not just look at the at whatever has been printed by the by the written or printed. Yeah, so that you can find that not so much in notebook programming, although a lot of people want to combine that in. That's definitely an ask. Um, you can find that in R. R, R, the programming language, it's big um, IDE is R Studio, and R Studio is an interactive development environment really similar to notebooks. It's not quite the same, but the inter the inspector panel for like you click on a line of code, you can either run it or you can inspect like the value of the variables and stuff. I don't think it's as powerful as like what you could do in small talk, but it's the same general idea. And that's a really important feature for our programmers. That's related. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, let's let's leave it there. Thank you again, Mary Beth. That was a fantastic talk. And thanks everyone for joining in questions.